Hello, everyone. It's Mr. Vallejo. Welcome to class. Uh, today, we'll be tackling the topic of climate change. Let's go ahead and get to our PowerPoint for today. Let's share the screen and let's take a look at climate change. In today's talk uh, about climate change, it seems like the more than the first half of the lecture will be everything I ever studied in my in uh, earth and space science class at the UCLA many, many years ago. But you need to understand the characteristics of the atmosphere in order to properly understand climate and climate change. So let's go ahead and take a look at that. This is based on chapter 15 in Cunningham and Cunningham's environmental science textbook. And so the uh, topics that we'll be covering today include these listed on the screen. We'll be taking a look at the atmosphere and how uh, weather is experienced in different regions of our country. Uh, we'll take a look at uh, 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 natural climate variability, but then unnatural climate variability comes into play when we take a look at anthropogenic climate change, which means that it's, it's uh, human induced. And we'll take a look at the effects and the solutions as we go through today's talk. All righty, the atmosphere is a very complex system, but first, before we go into the characteristics of the atmosphere, let's uh, define the terms that we need to use. Uh, weather is a short-lived local pattern. And, it, and when you're taking a look at weather, you do incorporate the idea of temperature and precipitation. Uh, many of you will uh, will look back and and uh, remember that uh, when I spoke about biomes and and ecosystems, that the determining factor, uh, the uh, characteristics of the area that are important when determining which biome you might be in uh, is uh, the our temperature and precipitation. So weather is temperature and precipitation due to circulation of the air in the first layer in the troposphere, whereas climate is long-term patterns, not short-term, but long-term patterns of temperature and precipitation. So weather is what you experience on a day-to-day -day basis, but climate is what your expect expectations might be on a yearly basis or even in a, a multi-year schedule. So now that you know the difference between weather and climate, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a look at the atmosphere. And you may know that the atmosphere <clears throat> is, nit is made up of mostly nitrogen, then oxygen. And then there are other molecules uh, that are floating around in the atmosphere. That is significant when we talk about climate change. Okay, so, um, going back to that slide, uh, I have a little poem that I, I use to remember the parts of the atmosphere. And it goes like this. Nitrogen is 78, oxygen is 21, all the rest is less than one. So nitrogen gas, 78% of the atmosphere. Oxygen, oxygen gas is a little short of 21%. And then water vapor, depending on where you are on the earth, it might be zero over a desert, might be 5% over an ocean, about 5% uh, aerosols uh, that are scattered throughout the, the uh, atmosphere, also important when it comes to determining climate change. Argon, uh, usually the given number is about 1%. So if you look at it, if 78% if nitrogen, 21% oxygen, water vapor, 5%. Look, we're already over, right? Um, uh, and then you have things, you have solid particles, 
although they might be uh, very, very small particles. Uh, here in Southern California, where I live, uh, we used to kid about uh, the city of Santa Barbara because we, where, where I live, you would look out towards Santa Barbara and you get these beautiful red and purple sunsets. That's because of, uh, you know, the uh, in the last 10 years, there's been many, many fires in that area. Uh, as you know, California, one, uh, one, one result of climate change is the amount of wildfires that we have here in California. So, um, so particles are important because they would uh, cause those red and purple uh, and beautiful orange colors in the atmosphere. But uh, you know that, that that's not such a good thing, uh, especially for all the living things in that part of California. So um, uh, you can also see that less than 1% of the atmosphere then is going to be greenhouse gases, which are responsible for climate change. And we'll see that uh, Usually we talk about carbon dioxide, but there's also methane in there. And uh, those are significant when we take a look at, at climate change. All right, as we look at the atmosphere, there are four different layers of the atmosphere. Actually, NASA says there are five different layers. And if NASA says something, you gotta listen. But going from the bottom up, from the, uh, from the ground up, you have the troposphere. The troposphere is is immediately adjacent to the Earth's surface at the zero to about uh, 10 miles up. Uh, it says here ranges in depth from 18 kilometers over the pole, over the equator, to eight kilometers over the pole, then out over the pole. Um, if you don't speak uh, metric, then I remember that uh, when you when you when I used to run. Uh, a 10K that was 6.2 miles. So 20K is gonna be about 12 miles. So as you can see, it's uh, 12 miles up the high and then it gets thinner over the poles. So I like, like to remember it this way, zero to 10 for the first layer, uh, 10 to 50 for the second layer. Um, or, and, and so uh, we'll see the second layer in a second. So that's a troposphere. Uh, convection currents redistribute heat and moisture around the globe. We'll see that in several slides uh, that are coming up. And the air te temperature drops rapidly with increase in distance from the earth. Um, this creates a problem in, in my local area. Uh, we have sometimes what are called temperature inversions. And uh, the simple explanation is that the air close to the ground is warm. Uh, as heat, as the, the sunlight is absorbed by the ground and the air goes uh, upward, then the temperature, as you increase in altitude, the temperature increases. Oops, check that. The temperature decreases. Think of it on a, oh, let's say, do you remember um, when you were a kid and you swam all day, those of you in warmer regions, uh, and, and you got out of the pool uh, it, and, uh, and wanted to warm up. Well, what we would do when I was a kid is uh, we would go to the municipal, which was actually called the municipal pool. Yeah, but we, we didn't know that. And so we called it the municipal. And when we got out of the pool after swimming for two, three hours, we wanted to warm up. We would get out and put our, put our towels on the, on the concrete and then lay on the concrete all spread out. And that would warm us up. Why? Because the earth has that heat uh, from the sunlight, from the infrared uh, uh, solar energy. And so that is uh, that, that energy is coming back to us as heat. So down by the ground, it's warm. As you go up though, in the troposphere, which you see as the temperature is, is uh, decreasing. Okay, and then there's a, the tropopause where it's no longer uh, decreasing and seems to be, seems to kind of plateau right there. But that means that we are ready to go to the next layer, which is the stratosphere. And the stratosphere up to about 50 kilometers again. So if you take six, 6.2 miles and 
and multiply that times five, that's about 30. So uh, zero to 10, 10 to 40, about, you know, these are, uh, these are iffy numbers, uh, approximate numbers, but you know, to, to, to help you remember them, sometimes we take a look at miles and say zero to 10 and, and 10 to 40 and or maybe 10 to 30 and then 30 to 50 for the next layer and 50 to 300 for the last layer. Um, stratosphere, uh, it's the, it has almost no water vapor, but a thousand times more ozone than the troposphere. Now, this is the, the bottom part of the stratosphere is where the ozone layer is. Ozone is a pollutant down, down low. I know that because I live in the Los Angeles metropolitan area. And uh, one thing they track, and one reason they say we have the worst air in the whole United States is because our ozone layers are high. Now, isn't ozone good? Well, not when you're breathing it, but ozone is good when it's in the stratosphere, when it's in the second layer of the stratosphere, I mean, second layer of the atmosphere, at the bottom of the stratosphere. And that's where the ozone layer works for us and absorbs the ultraviolet light, which warms the upper part of the stratosphere, uh, blocks those UVA and UAB waves. Uh, and uh, so the ozone layer protects us that way. Okay. Uh, ozone is being depleted by pollutants, uh, including freons and bromine. Uh, uh, it was uh, years ago when we stopped using uh, Freon for many different things. And so we have uh, um, implemented different types of uh, uh, chemicals for, for other uses. Uh, there used to be uh, a big use in the United States of a chemical called CFC. Uh, and that's a group of chemicals that the CFC stood for chlorofluorocarbons. And uh, those CFCs would uh, be released from a spray can and uh, they were the propellant that in an aerosol can, and that going into the atmosphere would take out a hundred thousand. One molecule of CFC, it said, could take out a hundred thousand ozone molecules. So, uh, starting in the 80s, we thought that there was maybe uh, a uh, reduction in the ozone in the ozone layer. So they called that the the hole in the ozone layer. Uh, and the, that the strict definition is, those is, is that a, it's a 50% reduction. So we see that occurring over Antarctica starting around 1980 or so. Um, you can take a look at that and, and uh, see the pictures of it. It looks like uh, that is uh, something that is actually happening. Um, is there a significant uh, impact of the whole of the whole the ozone hole and uh, it was predicted that, that there would be more cases of say skin cancer in south africa and and australia being there in the southern hemisphere um, there has been a slight uh, slight increase in in cancer in those areas but um, some would say on the other hand that ozone the whole the ozone layer is cyclical and uh, it would form naturally anyway. So um, then our research says uh, that it has increased and, and most likely it's due to human activity. <clears throat> so we have the troposphere, the stratosphere, and then we have the mesosphere. The mesosphere, meso means middle. So middle layer where the atmosphere diminishes uh, in temperature. So uh, another way to remember this uh, is, is say with, with the phrase down up, down up. And so uh, in the first layer, the troposphere, the, the temperature goes down. And then in the stratosphere, it goes up. And the mesosphere goes down. That's what it says right here. The temperature diminishes again in thermosphere. Hence the name thermo, it's temperatures going up. And what's happening in the thermosphere, which is sometimes called the ionosphere in the lower layer, especially, um, then the temperature is going up because most of the, your gas molecules are going to be pulled down towards the earth um, because of gravity. 
And, and so 80% of the atmosphere, no, 80% of the, of the uh, uh, molecules in the atmosphere are going to be in the troposphere. And as you go up, you're going to get less and less of that. That's why we have weather in the, uh, therm uh, in the uh, troposphere, but in the stratosphere, you, you hard to see any of that because you're sitting on top of the clouds. And as you go to the mesosphere, you don't see any uh, of that. You're lucky to see, uh, you know, if you are just sitting there in the mesosphere, you might see, uh, uh, you look down low, you will see uh, some weather balloons and uh, experimental aircraft. Uh, uh, that's a mesosphere. And the thermosphere, uh, again, is the temperature is getting higher because the very few molecules that are in the thermosphere uh, are being bombarded by, by solar energy. And that is what's increasing the, uh, the temperature. Uh, I, was, I was saying that NASA said there's a fifth layer, it's called the exosphere. And others would say, well, that's basically outer space. So, and then here is uh, some information about the uh, ionosphere with the Northern Lights in it. And here's a, your classic diagram that shows you that, that in the troposphere is going down and then it's one going up and then down and up. And then we have zero to 10, 10 to 30 or 40, uh, 30 to 40 to 50 and 50 to 300. So um, those are the elevations and this is the, uh, the trend of the temperatures as you increase in, in altitude. Um, and then where you have the term pause, that's where you have a straight up and down line. That means that the temperature really isn't changing right there. So those are the um, layers or the, uh, you know, the boundaries between these uh, different uh, atmospheric layers. All right, so now you know something about the atmosphere. And uh, <clears throat> uh, we also have an idea of, of the absorbed solar energy. These are approximate numbers, but they're pretty close. About one quarter is reflected by the clouds. Um, by the atmosphere of all the energy that comes from the sun that hits the earth, another quarter is absorbed. So we have a quarter reflected and a quarter absorbed, absorbed by, by molecules that are in the air. Carbon dioxide is a, is a really important one, methane also, not neglecting water vapor also. Um, as water vapor absorbs the solar energy, then uh, that is seen by us as the weather. And then it says about half reaches the Earth's surface. And, uh, and then some of the solar energy is reflected back by portions of the Earth's surface. Um, and let's see here. Uh, uh, and that's because different surfaces of the Earth reflect things differently, like, uh, you know, something that's really dark might absorb the heat, just like, like you going outside on, on a sunny day with a black shirt on versus a white shirt on, you might feel a little bit cooler with that white shirt on because it's reflecting uh, the solar energy. But if you've got a black shirt on, then you might feel a little warmer because it's absorbing that energy. And it's the same idea with the Earth's surface whether it's covered with water, um, the ice and snow and ice is gonna reflect that. And so uh, this uh, diagram here from the environmental science textbook shows you some uh, numbers. Uh, one number that, oh, and here is a table showing you the uh, albedo of surfaces. And so you can see that here, the, the white surfaces have a greater percentage of the reflection of the light, but then things like uh, black soil, 3%, and that makes sense, but the average is, is 30. So, um, you know, uh, that, that means if, if the reflection is 30, that means 70% of that 50% is going to be absorbed and then uh, uh, as it comes back, uh, from the ground, 
then it's going to be be uh, coming back as as heat, which is a form of energy. So here, most solar energy reaching the Earth is near infrared, and then when it comes back, like I said, and then when it comes back up into the atmosphere, it's going to come up as heat. Um, energy readmitted by the Earth is mainly far infrared radiation, and there it is right there. That's heat. Um, to remind you, the uh, electromagnetic spectrum, uh, there's a visual, the visual portion of the electromagnetic magnetic spectrum, which is the uh, colors of the rainbow. Uh, Roy G. Biv, if you remember. So uh, you have red meaning, you know, R meaning red, uh, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. So on the uh, other side of violet, you have ultraviolet. So those, those have more energy. Um, and then on the other side of red, uh, you have infrared. And so infrared uh, energy has a longer wavelength. It's not in the visible wavelength. That, uh, uh, we don't perceive infrared energy uh, at, at visually, but uh, it has a longer wavelength, which means it has, a, has less energy. That's why uh, when you uh, point your remote control at yourself, you're not injuring yourself because there's not enough energy to cause any problems. Alrighty. Um, so the greenhouse effect is is what we is the old term, the archaic term, if you will, uh, for global warming. Uh, with the greenhouse effect, since it's a natural phenomenon where the atmosphere transmits sunlight while trapping heat. If you can think of a greenhouse, if you've ever seen a greenhouse, which is a, uh, it has a the frame of a, a house, but it has a plastic, clear plastic or acrylic or glass uh, walls and, and a roof. That's where you might grow some plants. Well, uh, that's not necessarily a bad thing. That's what supports life. Uh, however, it does increase the temperature. So that is... Uh, uh, this has been known for for years, for decades, the greenhouse effect. Um, the important greenhouse effect gases we know are, are carbon dioxide. This is the one you're going to hear about the most, but water vapor and methane also uh, retain heat. Uh, we can uh, have, uh, we can influence the greenhouse effect, uh, and we have as humans by burning fossil fuels, by combustion of fossil fuels, and that, that creates extra carbon dioxide. And the carbon dioxide per, uh, concentration in the atmosphere has increased dramatically. Uh, ever since the Industrial Revolution in the 1860s, 70s, up until this point in history, uh, but more so in the last 50 years or so. Also, deforestation destroys carbon sinks, and uh, that was especially a bad problem in the 1990s when people would go into tropical rainforests and just cut all those things down, burn them off, take the ashes, dig them into the soil, and grow some, some uh, crops for three, four, five years. When the soil got bad, because tropical soil is not very uh, nutrient rich. Uh, then you would go somewhere else and do it again. And so you can see, still see satellite images of, uh, of uh, plots of virgin tropical forest, tropical rainforest areas that experience this problem. All righty, um, let's take a look at convection currents and uh, movement in the atmosphere. Um, how that's related to pressure and how uh, uh, how the atmosphere at different temperatures can hold uh, different amounts of water. Basically, when it uh, when the uh, when the atmosphere cools, it drops its water, and uh, as you know. Uh, heat rises. So what happens is that as the atmosphere, 
around the equator because it's getting hot, yeah, from the sun that's, that's hitting the earth straight on instead of at an angle. Well, that insulation it's called, that increase in insulation makes it so that the air at the equator is warmer. And so as that air is warmer, it rises up. And as it gets pushed toward either pole, it's gonna cool down. And as it cools down, it has to dump its water. This is why the tropical rainforests are found around the equator. And so this air will get pushed uh, toward the poles and then at a, uh, at a, a latitude of about 20 or so, both north and south, then it's gonna start to come back down and as it comes back down, it's able, the air is able to hold more, um, more water vapor. And so it, it essentially sucks out the water from the atmosphere. So when it gets to the ground, it's not raining right there. So this is why the deserts are typically at a latitude of, of 20 plus, both south and north of the equator. So, um, so uh, this is called latent heat as the, uh, the heat that is in that atmosphere, especially in, in the water vapor. But uh, that is essentially how, how convection works. And you have, you have those uh, cells of, of, of uh, movement uh, in the air. And, and so at the equator, you have the air moving up and then it goes toward the poles, gets a certain uh, latitude and then starts to come down. And again, you see the tropical rainforest and the deserts are a result of this air movement. Oh, look, here's a, here's a uh, diagram of it. Here's a cell, here is the air getting moving up, the warm air is moving up. And then as it gets moved out, this is the tropical rainforest. Okay, but then right over here at 20 plus, you're gonna see that this, this air comes down uh, because this is pushing, this air right here is getting pushed over towards the equator. And then as it goes towards the equator, it's, it's getting heated up as it gets heated up and moves over there. And that's how you get the movement going. Well, over here, this is where you get the, your deserts. Look, this is um, in the United States, the, the border of Mexico, you know, right here, is you're gonna get your deserts right there at 20 plus. Okay. All right. Uh, resulting latent heat causes air to rise, cool, and lose more water vapor as precipitation. Like I said, this, uh, there's a lot of content in this uh, in this talk um, concerning uh, the atmosphere, and like I said, it was it's almost everything I learned um, in Earth and space science. Um, so, uh, so there's good information here. All right, it also has to do with pressure, and the uh, when you have a high pressure area, it's essentially pushing the air towards a low pressure area. And uh, the, it's not just two dimensions. The pressure is, is uh, lower uh, at a higher altitude than, and the pressure is, is, is uh, higher, closer to the ground, then the air is gonna get pushed up as you saw in the previous diagram. Alrighty. So uh, right, we call these winds when we have movement of air. Right, so in this diagram here, you can see that, oops, you can have a, uh, here's the, the air getting, the, uh, yeah, the air getting warmed up. As it gets warmed up, it needs to drop all its water, not all of its water, but it needs to drop its water. It gets pushed over here. The air moves towards a high pressure area over here. And then as it, as the air warms up, the, the moisture comes out of the atmosphere. So then you don't have any rain right there. So uh, 
that is the diagram right there for convection currents. Now, weather events follow general patterns um, and they're, they're predictable, um, less predictable in, you know, in immediate days. Uh, physical conditions in the atmosphere over short time scales, that's what we define as a weather, but remember, compare that to the climate and climate is, is long-term uh, expectations and temperature and precipitation. Speaking of precipitation, why does it rain? It says here, it, air cools as it rises and water condenses as air cools. So uh, the water condenses as air cools and chemically speaking, less water can be in the form of water vapor uh, when the atmosphere is cooler. All right, the pressure decreases as the air rises. And so this also causes the cooling. And also you have to have something in the, uh, in the atmosphere. Uh, this, is the, uh, this is the science behind the background of, of cloud seeding. And you've got to have tiny particles that, that the water molecules can coalesce around. And then uh, as they do that, they'll condense and they'll come down as liquid water or rain. Uh, here's a mention of the Coriolis effect. The Coriolis effect, as these, the uh, air moves to the north or to the south, uh, away from the equator, it doesn't move just straight north or straight south. You have to keep into account the rotation of the earth. So um, it's going to be in a curved pattern. And since the curving pattern results in the fact that the earth rotates in an eastward direction as the winds move about it. And that's called the Coriolis effect. They used to say that if you flush a toilet in Australia, it'll go counterclockwise. Well, it's not that studies that later showed that really it's a, uh, the, you know, the shape of the toilet or uh, other factors were more influential, but uh, uh, that's a Coriolis effect. Okay, so, uh, all right, uh, there's a slide on jet streams and it's not, just the, it's not just the air on the ground that we're interested in, just like it's not the, the uh, circulation of water at the top of the ocean, we need to look at it as a three-dimensional uh, object. And so it says here, the hurricane force winds at the top of the troposphere are, is, is what the jet streams are. And so the jet streams can, can totally influence uh, uh, the uh, atmosphere also. And you can see here's some, uh, here's the climate expectations for the jet stream. So you can see over here, depending on where you live, now this is for the polar jet stream. There are other jet streams, like if you live in Florida, I remember going to Florida and walking into the water and saying, you know, and what was it? It must have been August. In August, it was like bath water. Why is that? Well, because the, the uh, circulation of the ocean pattern uh, that's helped by the jet stream that's going up here along the eastern coast of the United States. It's coming up from that warm, warm area south of Florida and coming up on the right side. So uh, this is, this is a, a map of the polar jet streams and the polar jet streams certainly affect the, the weather patterns. Uh, ocean currents also modify weather and, and that's, I guess, what I was speaking of. Um, but it's also, it's not just on the surface, but also it would be, um, you can take a look at other areas. If you look at uh, off the coast of Chile, there is a upwelling of nutrients from the bottom of the ocean that come up as the, as the, uh, the water hits South America. It brings the nutrients up and we call that an upwelling. Okay. And many people rely on seasonal rains. Uh, as I speak here in 
Southern California, in California, the actually the whole state, uh, we are in a drought. We're in the third year of the drought, uh, which is a problem when it comes to things like uh, uh, you know, the uh, forest wildfires and such. In India, they have monsoons. Monsoons, uh, it's a seasonal reversal of wind patterns caused by differential heating and cooling rates of oceans and continents. Most prevalent in subtropical and tropical areas. I think there's a map on the on the next slide so we can see some of that. Um, and uh, and it has to do with the it's a, it's a seasonal rainy pattern. And if you take a look, let's look at the map. There it is. As this water comes from the Indian Ocean, okay, it, it has a lot of water in there because it's over water. And, and so um, chemically speaking, this water has a higher percentage of water vapor, but as it comes over here, and especially as it hits the largest mountain range in the world, the Himalayas, then it's forced up. And as the air is forced up, it cools. And as it cools, it can hold less water. So you're gonna get a really rainy area right here. And because you have a very rainy area right here, you see the rivers start to flood. And so that's why you get these floods in the monsoons in India. Okay, so that is a, an expectation that uh, uh, the, the climate in India, if you have that type of pattern. Okay, all right. Um, next slide says frontal systems create local weather. And um, so let's take a look at that. Uh, oh, this is a discussion of, of fronts. And uh, you have a cold front and you also have warm fronts. Uh, the cold air is, is heavier. So as a, as a cold air, air and, and warmer air meet, the cold air sinks and the, uh, the warm air goes on top of that. And so when that happens, you can get uh, some really good rains, uh, since you have thunderstorms. On the other hand, if you have a warm front and the warm front is moving, it's gonna move over a cold area. And, and so when you have that, you might see a different cloud pattern uh, and, and you'll see, uh, you see the feathery clouds called the cirrus clouds uh, as part of that cloud pattern. And if you take a look at the, it says it can bring days of drizzle, sure. Um, over here, here's the warm front and these are the feathery clouds. I'm talking about the cirrus clouds, but where you get the, uh, the nimbocumulus clouds and the alto stratus clouds, that's like right here and right here. That's where you're gonna get the rain. Okay, the alto stratus are really high uh, in that picture, not so high in this one here, but uh, especially with the uh, nimbocumulus clouds, those are the ones that have a lot of, of uh, association with rain. And so you see that coming out there. All right, there's also cyclonic storms that occur like hurricanes and uh, tornadoes um, and uh, also uh, your hurricanes at the Atlantic. Uh, Katrina, obviously those of you in my, my Baton Rouge class have uh, you know personal practical knowledge of, of uh, some hurricanes, especially not just Katrina, but recently we've had a really bad one also. Uh, we really messed up uh, the uh, uh, the semester last was it last semester last semester we had to delay the start of the semester and uh, we had to uh, do a lot of uh, changes with the uh, the uh, the academic calendar because some people. Some people were, uh, you know, in the rain and uh, uh, and some people flooded out. Some people um, didn't have uh, didn't have electricity for three weeks or so. Other people just didn't have internet for a few days. So there are all kinds of problems we had uh, due to the hurricane. Typhoons in the 
in the uh, Western Pacific, and then also tornadoes. Those of you in my Baton Rouge class, again, uh, you have uh, personal experiences, I'm sure, that you could share uh, about tornadoes. If you're in my, my Eastern West Virginia class, uh, you might have something as well. But ooh, tornadoes are uh, not something that we typically have in, in California, but uh, but uh, yeah, tornadoes are are a result of of uh, systems fronts that are colliding. All right. So remember, with climate variability, there is a natural climate variability and expectation, um, and and we know that because we are uh, have taken ice cores um, from glaciers. And those seem to be you know, remarkably consistent records of, of, uh, of weather patterns, of climate patterns over the years. Um, because what you can do is you could, you could take the ice and take a, and analyze the, the ice and extrapolate and say, okay, well, if this much carbon dioxide, let's say, is in the ice and in the air bubbles, um, that are in the ice, then you could uh, you could extract that or extrapolate that and say, okay, well, then this is what happened at this point. And and if you have an ice core, the the deeper down you are, the you know the longer it the, the older the the information is because it's like if you have a stack of newspapers. Uh, I get the I get the newspaper every day, and we. My wife reads it, but uh, when she's done, she throws it in, a, in the newspaper pile. And so sometimes it gets uh, you know, a couple feet high before you know we, we toss it. And so if you were to look at that though, the, the uh, oldest newspaper is on the very bottom of that pile. And at the very top of that pile is just yesterday's paper. So ice cores are that way too. The, the information at the very top is the new information and the information at the very bottom of the ice core is uh, is from a long, long time ago. Okay. All right, look at this, uh, 420,000 years. You can see uh, information from that far back. All right. And um, in, in taking a look at ice cores, uh, there was information from the Little Ice Age of the 1400s. And what this tells is that, you know, it doesn't have to be thousands of years where you have this, this climate, but it could be a short period of time. It could be a few decades long. It could even be shorter than that. But uh, we sometimes think about, oh, well, the climate two million years ago was such and such, and it must have lasted for another million years. Well, the information we have from ice cores says, no, it could change pretty quickly for sure for a much shorter amount of time. All righty. Um, this is an uh, aberration um, of the Milankovitch cycle. Um, but as we take a look at this, um, see. you can see in the picture that it, the earth is not always at a 22, 22 and a half angle. Uh, but uh, the axis sometimes goes to 24, so it's had a little bit of a wobble to this tilt, as you can see here, it says axial wobble. And uh, in this diagram, you can see that there, the earth may be closer or further from the sun. Uh, it's not a, a perfect uh, elliptical orbit that doesn't change. It uh, does have the movement to it. So. Um, so these would also explain some of the uh, climate patterns that we we have. Alrighty. And so the ocean also has a cycle. There are also decades long oscillations in the oceans and the atmospheres. Um, there's certain uh, patterns of uh, of current movement that we expect, but these 
may change and even reverse in some cases, uh, uh, but, uh, but this may change for a little bit at a time. And so the, the, the climate might change uh, for, for years, even decades, uh, because of the uh, change in the, in the uh, ocean circulation patterns. All right. An example of this is the El Nino or the ENSO, which stands for the El Nino Southern Oscillation. And so uh, that's when we, we uh, remember years ago, maybe 10 years ago, we used to blame everything on El Nino in California. Um, even the, uh, you know, the Lakers losing or something like that. Okay, the El Nino, the El Nino is when the warm surface waters in the Pacific Ocean move, move backwards, it seems, uh, to, uh, to South America. And what you'll see is that as the waters go across, the equatorial waters go back towards North and South America, then uh, the, uh, the currents get pushed up along the eastern part of uh, you know, the uh, yeah, the eastern part of the Pacific Ocean, and the that would be the west coast of uh, of Central America and North America. And as the currents come up there, we're used to getting some cold water from Alaska, but then you start getting those warm waters during a El Nino event. And you'll see fish that you never expected to see in even Southern California. So that's one of the uh, effects of El Nino, when you have that reverse of, of the current and you have the warm water coming up instead of uh, the, uh, the typical, in the Northern Pacific, you typically have a, a clockwise uh, movement of water, which means that water coming down from Alaska from the Western coast of Canada, um, which is cooler, obviously, um, as it hits the uh, United States uh, than the, that, we typically have a, a cooler water. So uh, where I grew up in Central California, when we uh, would go to the beach, it was never really, uh, you know, really warm beach like the Miami beach I was telling you about. Uh, it was uh, usually quite cool, but uh, during a El Nino event, uh, you have a, you have some warm water coming up from Mexico and that's actually a nice change. Um, all right, so uh, the third bullet says southern waters or surface waters driven westward by trade winds allow upwelling of cold nutrient rich waters off what the west coast of South America. And that's what I was, uh, I'm talking about when it comes to uh, the upwelling that, um, that uh, helps the fishing industry off the coast of, of Chile and uh, Ecuador. Uh, that area, you're going to see the upwelling, and then you're going to see have, have more fish than the stronger fish uh, catch those years. Okay. All right. Um, and uh, uh, I, I mentioned fish effects of El Nino in Southern California, but uh, uh, in the Western United States, we during our El Nino year, it's typically a a, a much rainier time. Um, in Southern California, we have what's called a Mediterranean uh, um, ecosystem, or even a, a, it's a in, in this part of, of California, what we have is we have, uh, we, we have a short rainy season, but we don't expect rain during the summer, like a lot of you do, depending on, on where you live in the United States. But um, but when you have an El Nino, uh, you do get a, a, a much rainier uh, time uh, between October and February, you might have uh, a, a notable increase in rain. Alrighty, and then in between the El Ninos, you have La Nina, and that's the, uh, uh, the hmm, opposite effect, if you will, uh, hot and dry weather. Um, and so uh, the effects of La Nina years between El Ninos um, might be, uh, you know, uh, increase in hurricanes and such. 
as you can see, the surface temperatures of the ocean uh, it might cause a hurricane to be even more violent than they they are. And here's a diagram that shows that this is um, this shows you the upwelling that happens right there as the cold water comes up. That's what we mean by an upwelling. And this is typically what happens. The trade winds go across um, from, from east to west. And so that is the typical pattern. But then what you see in this diagram here uh, in an El Nino event, what you're gonna see is these, the uh, circulation is gonna stall out. And over here, you're gonna have a much rainier time uh, during an El Nino season, as I already said. All righty. Um, these recent changes are unusually rapid, and this is because of um, the climate change. And uh, so, there are many scientists believe that anthropogenic climate change is the most important environmental issue of our time. Anthropogenic means of human origin. So this has been known for a while, since 1957, an increase in the carbon dioxide level from 315 parts per million to almost 400 parts per million 10 years ago. Okay, so we could double the atmospheric carbon dioxide levels within a century that could have drastic, tragic events. You can see here what's important to look at is the, uh, the temperature, which is the solid black line. That's going up there. Uh, no, no, what is that? That is the, that's the carbon dioxide levels increasing and increasing. And over here, the, the uh, purple blue line that is uh, going up along with that, you can see the trend for all of these measurements uh, are just increasing. Uh, look at this, uh, the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, says that there's a 90% probability that climate changes are due to humans. And we could probably uh, two to four degrees Celsius, if, and if you're not a metric person, three to eight degrees increase in temperature, that sounds actually quite alarming. If you can consider where you are and, and add, you know, add 10 degrees to where you are, is that, sound great? It does not. And it, if it's a 10 degrees increase, that's in Fahrenheit. Like if it's a two to four degrees Celsius increase, this is kind of telling. Uh, there's been a five degrees Celsius rise since the last ice age. So we're going to add another four on top of that. That's going to be, you know, very warm. <clears throat> Here are the effects, more people with more extreme weather, floods, heat waves, hurricanes, it sounds like Louisiana. Um, these uh, could have disastrous economic and human cost. Um, look at this one though, sea level rise of 0.6 meters. That is, uh, is that, that's about two feet. Um, so low-lying coastal cities like New Orleans, Miami could be affected. If you look at the elevation in New Orleans, New Orleans is a lot of it's under the sea level, average like around, oh wait, six, which is what we said. If you take a look at this picture, this picture, this is, uh, this is a projection. The current shoreline, here's the coast of Louisiana right there. All right, there's the Lake Pontchartrain right there. Look at this, New Orleans is barely out there. Um, and this is when? By 2100. So it's, uh, you know, you might live to see this, I might, but uh, you might live to see, look at here's Miami. And then here, look at this big chunk of Florida. It's now underwater. See Everglades right there. So uh, that's a projected sea level rise by 2100. Um, I remember though in the 80s, when I first started teaching, they said by the year 2000, there's a, a more than 60% chance of the of an earthquake happening in Southern California, a magnitude six or higher. Um, what did we have? We had 1994, we had a pretty good earthquake. Um, 
but uh, nothing real big yet. So we're still waiting here. Uh, but the other thing was uh, a 60, 60 feet rise in the sea level possibly. And so those of you in my uh, uh, College of the Canyons classes, all right, we're 1300 feet up. We used to joke back then that, you know, you should buy some property in Palmdale, Lancaster. It's going to be oceanfront property uh, within your lifetime. Woo! That'd be something else. I think that's why all the people moved out to Palmdale, Lancaster in the 90s. But uh, that, thankfully, the ocean level did not raise that, that high. But for most people, are still only in Lancaster, Palmdale, because they, because of the economic environment, speaking of environment. Yeah, but that's another lecture for another time. Uh, carbon dioxide is the most important greenhouse gas, but it's not the only one, okay? That carbon dioxide uh, is, uh, is released from the combustion of fossil fuels. But we also know that methane is a, um, is a big contributor to, um, Greenhouse uh, gas. Well, it's a is a greenhouse gas that contributes to to climate change. And um, it's said that and I, the numbers may be different from what I remember, but I remember uh, reading something that said that there's forty percent forty percent of the methane in the atmosphere is due to the flatulence of cows and. Uh, livestock. Huh. Wow. Uh, so, I, and then uh, others will tell you, well, well, then in order to decrease, decrease that, we should all eat lower on the, on the food chain. And uh, that is evidence or, um, you know, that, that's an argument for a, a vegetarian type of lifestyle. So methane, and uh, these are the greenhouse gases. Remember that water is one also. Um, computer models provide evidence of human caused climate change. If you take a look at uh, some of the, the, at the diagram for this one, that's what's telling for me. Uh, let's take a look at that as we uh, look at in the, if you take a look at the, the key at the bottom here, it says models, models using both natural and anthropogenic forcings, okay. So that's in purple there, but then blue, or what is that? That's pink. Uh, but the, uh, the blue is only natural. So if you have natural and then you have natural and humans, you can see that, well then it's, it's because of humans that we have this global warming because this is without, uh, without human influence, and this is with human influence, more so on the land than in the ocean, which makes sense, but globally, you still see a significant change. So climate models tell us, yeah, the atmosphere is changing. Uh, there is global warming and it is due to people. So, all right, why should you care? Well, let's take a look at some ideas there. Uh, the idea of climate change is overwhelming and if current trends continue, it most likely will be hotter than any point. And I've checked this out in the last 2 million years and that's because of the way we live. Wow, that's pretty, oh, I don't know, it's mind blowing, isn't it? The average global temperature climb one degree Fahrenheit in the last century, 19 of the 20, 19 of the 20 warmest years in the past 150 years is when we have reliable data that have occurred since 1980. Goals are warming the fastest, permafrost is melting, people's houses are falling over. Climate change observations, the Arctic Sea is, the ice in the Arctic Sea is half as thick as it was 30 years ago. Polar bears, you seen that? 
that Coca-Cola, Coca-Cola commercial and that polar bear is trying to swim. And he doesn't have anything to swim. They can swim like 50 miles, they say. But now to go from, from a, you know, from a large piece of ice to the next large piece of ice is swim and swim and swim, which is uh, the reason why polar bears are dying out. Uh, ice shelves are disappearing, so the number of penguins has re reduced. Look at this, 50% in the last 50 years. And penguins are one of my three favorite animals. Just so you don't have to wonder, my other two are uh, sea otters and gray whales. Okay. Glaciers are retreating all over the world. The oceans are absorbing and storing more heat. Oh man, I just read a, uh, if you're in my canyons class, you're probably reading the, the, uh, the sixth extinction uh, novel, a uh, series of essays, um, very uh, disturbing uh, reading uh, in certain ways. Um, so uh, if, uh, if you'd like to read a, a uh, New York Times best-selling book about uh, extinction, which is occurring right now, the sixth extinction, then I highly suggest that. Sea level has risen 15 to 20 centimeters, not much, in the last century. And the oceans are absorbing some of the extra carbon dioxide, but that is acidifying the ocean and damaging corals even. A change of 0.4 uh, in the pH is, is uh, you know, wow. it's just not just damaging, but destroying the coral reefs. And they say uh, that by 2100, that there just might be just very few coral on Earth. Observations of climate change, different things happening, growing seasons. Uh, are changing in all over the place. Some are lengthening in the Northern Hemisphere, uh, timing of different things. Some animals are breeding earlier, they're extending their range, whereas others are disappearing because they, uh, they don't make it. In biology, we say that there's Gauss's law of competitive exclusion. You could either, you could win uh, against competitors or you can move to a different location or you could just die out. Droughts are more frequent and widespread. Storms are more severe. Um, I don't have to tell you Louisiana people about storms um, recently. Um, drought, you, if you're in my California class, three, third year, the California drought, uh, here in Southern California, uh, we just changed from, you can water your grass for two days a week and we just went to one day a week. Oh, it's horrible. Uh, and reading migratory schedules, we're all changing everything. Everybody, um, all the organisms need to adapt to this change in climate. <clears throat> and if you don't change, adapt, then you have the risk of going extinct. Um, you wanna get taxed on it? Well, this slide says, better now than later. Look at this. The, uh, the cost would be 0.5% of the gross domestic product. Um, but if, if we wait, it'd be 20%. Um, we need to cut. Energy production will need to be 80% decarbonized by 2050, just to stabilize the climate. So uh, can we do it? Well, in developed countries, maybe. What about the poor countries? 200 million people will become refugees because of floods or drought. Extremes. Four steps for combating climate change. Emissions trading, you, you read about that and see that on the news about uh, carbon, uh, meaning carbon uh, uh, demands and uh, carbon levels. 
technology sharing with less developed countries, reducing deforestation, which we have done, but we need to do even more in helping poor countries respond to climate change. Why should they change what they're doing? They're just trying to live. Well, um, they can't. Um, so you've got to, we've got to make it so that they can to make decisions that are good for climate change instead of you know burning uh, this, uh, this coal in an inefficient way. Well, then maybe we could uh, help them with technology so that they could uh, sustain themselves with solar energy or something like that. Uh, flooding storms and disease, look at this. 100 meters flooding coastal areas where a third of the world's population live. If you think of, uh, of the United States, where does everyone live and where does everyone want to live? Well, they want to live by some, some ocean. If it's oceanfront or waterfront property, a third of the, of the world's population lives there. Okay. Uh, here's some info about the Kyoto Protocol. Um, this is an illustration of when where environmental science, unlike other sciences, uh, is, uh, has an aspect, uh, has an opinion aspect to it and a political aspect to it, more so than, uh, than other sciences. Um, so uh, this is a Kyoto Protocol where nations were called to roll back carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, and other greenhouse gas emissions by 5% below 1990 levels by 2012. And we didn't pass this. Okay. And it looks like neither did Australia. But, uh, you know, um, should we have? Ooh. And that's the things that we, we look at. And, uh, history will remember whether we made the correct decision or not. Um, I was mentioned carbon trading earlier. And so uh, carbon trading between even countries, you know, you could uh, uh, take a look at emissions, carbon emission. New Zealand uh, is touted as an area that, that wants to be a carbon neutral uh, country. And uh, hopefully they'll make that very soon. Um, there's been reductions by many countries. Uh, uh, the UK, for example, has reduced their their carbon uh, footprint uh, tremendously in the past uh, 15, 20 years. Um, stabilization wedges could work even now. We don't have to wait till later. We could do it now. Um, smaller pieces, smaller, uh, smaller solutions to uh, reducing the amount of carbon dioxide. Look at these, these are kind of interesting. Uh, to stabilize carbon emissions, we would need to cut seven gigatons over the next 50 years, that sounds like a lot. But look at these, these ideas. Um, if we could double the vehicle efficiency and have the miles we would drive, that would save 1.5 gig out of the seven, we could save 1.5 this way. However, think about it. Are you going to really cut the number of miles you drive uh, in your life right now. Uh, vehicle efficiency, is that something that government needs to um, legislate? Um, or can we motivate uh, car companies, automobile industry? Can we motivate them with governmental subsidies? And this again is, is where environmental science has as a, an opinion aspect to it. Can we do this? Energy efficient appliances, um, better light bulbs. So you probably have some weird looking light bulbs uh, these days um, that are left over from, from when we switched over um, to CFT light bulbs. And now we have these LED light bulbs that uh, they can make in all kinds of shapes, um, but they're much, much more efficient. Okay, is that hard to do? It's a little costly when you first do it. Um, light bulbs used to be four for four bucks, but now they're, 
I can buy a really good light bulb for $15 that could last for what's been in the box, 12 years or something. Mm, do I want to pay up front so much compared to what I used to? Or what if you could take two gigatons of it? We all do it. Take 340 million people in the United States and we're all doing it. Yeah, we can save a lot. Uh, capturing and storing carbon emissions from power plants and gas wells could save another another gigaton. So if you look at just these three suggestions, that's two, three and a half, four and a half. You're almost at seven. Here's some other ideas right there. We take a look at those and see if you can do anything about that. Depends on where you live. Look at this, add two million one megawatt uh, windmills, 50 times more than what we have. Um, you know, very windy areas in, in Southern California. There's some near Barstow. Uh, you have some by Paul Springs. Uh, my last trip to San Francisco, I drove past some by Tracy, California. Um, and, uh, and so, yeah, there's an opportunity to do that. Uh, I watched a documentary about, uh, I think it was the Netherlands that even put these uh, windmills out into the ocean where it's really windy. And so they have wind farms that are not even on land. So I mean, I mean, using up your usable land, uh, but you have them in the ocean. That's pretty neat. Alternative practices can be important. So this uh, slide talks about the uh, carbon capture and storage and the unique ways to do it. Um, I think uh, you can see it better on the diagram. And you can see that here you have carbon dioxide that's pumped into, into disused coal field, displaces methane. And then the methane gets pushed up, so it's easier. Same with uh, oil. If you pumped carbon dioxide into the uh, oil fields here, uh, it gets pushed up and it's uh, easier to take that out. Um, how about this one? Don't do this for drinking water, but you can take carbon dioxide and pump it into saline aquifers. These are, you know, when the, uh, this is uh, by the ocean, you might have a salty aquifer. And so you could uh, pump that carbon dioxide in there. Those are pretty ingenious ways of getting rid of carbon dioxide um, and uh, not just pumping it into, into the atmosphere. Maybe we should concentrate on methane also. Um, this slide says methane instead. I probably wouldn't say instead, uh, but uh, carbon dioxide does get all the press and we could also reduce methane emissions and that would uh, reduce global warming as well. And then the third bullet I mentioned earlier, reducing the number of ruminants, uh, reducing the number of cows. Yeah, the uh, reliance of the human, of the American diet on me, that could help. Are we willing to do it? That's the question, isn't it? So here's what some other countries are doing. Uh, the UK has rolled back its carbon dioxide emissions to 1990 levels already. Look at that, that's pretty good. Oh, I mentioned this earlier, New Zealand wants to be the first carbon neutral country. Germany has reduced carbon dioxide by 10%. What are we doing in the United States? That's a thing. Denmark is 20% of its electricity from windmills. And now it's gonna crank it up to 50%. China, China reduced emissions 20% between 1997 and 2005, because they now they, they burn coal more effectively. I think it went from something like 35% to 60% effective or efficient and effective. Um, and then individual cities have pledged to reduce carbon emissions, reduce their carbon footprint. So that's great. And here's some things that you can do. Um, and if you look at it from the top down, uh, would you be more willing? Uh, would you be willing to to uh, drive a fuel efficient vehicle? I would. If someone wants to give me a Tesla for free, wouldn't that be cool? Okay, so not for free, but would there be government incentives or would the economy um, be in such a situation where the, the price would come down dramatically and, and uh, 
people could afford it without going into uh, massive debt. What about carpooling? Can you do that? That's pretty easy. Or trip chaining and instead of uh, driving to the store every time you need one thing, you know, stock that, uh, write it on your list for when you get to 20, then you can drive into town. I don't live right where the stores are. Every time we need something, if I go in every time, it's a lot of gas, you know? Uh, make your home more efficient, make your uh, driving behavior, just uh, starting and stopping. Uh, there are many things that we can do. And so here's a list to take a look at, see if you're willing to do anything, if anything is practical for you. And you can see the uh, potential emissions reduction just by changing your behaviors. Ooh, so climate change, is it for reals? Well, in this talk, we learned about uh, uh, different aspects of the atmosphere. And so, uh, so now you know something about climate um, and weather and how it's influenced by, by uh, characteristics of the atmosphere and composition of the atmosphere. And we looked at climate change and we saw that it seems like that is a thing and that it is actually occurring. And we saw some of the effects that uh, may, may be seen in the next 40, 50 years due to climate change, maybe up to 20, uh, 20, uh, 2100, you know? Uh, and then, you know, it, it's not all gloom and doom. We can change some of this. Uh, we can stop it if we're willing to do it. And so uh, these are all things to think about when it comes to environmental science. So I hope I gave you something to think about and, uh, and uh, climate change, uh, what can we do? What can you do? All right, well, have a great day and it was good seeing you in class today and we'll see you next time. I'm Mr. Vallejo, bye now.